Hello everyone and welcome to this second round of the Weaving Europe conference. Today we have a very, very interesting day because we are going to talk about enabling sustainability through heritage collections. We're going to talk about new discoveries in Sicilian museums and of course data interoperability. And also we will discuss uh, about artificial intelligence meeting cultural heritage. So stay tuned and I'm really, really happy to welcome everyone to this second day. And we will begin with our keynote speaker for today. He's, his name is Jose Luis Perdesoli. He comes from ECROM, so I think he doesn't need an, a, a really strong introduction, but in any case, I'll go do it. Uh, Jose Luis will talk about sus enabling sustainability through heritage collections, and he has a background in polymer chemistry with focus on cellulosic materials and applications in the area of paper-based heritage conservation. He has worked as a conservation scientist at the Cultural Heritage Agency of the Netherlands and at ICROM, the International Center for the Study of Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property in Rome. Since 2005, Jose Luis has been working internationally in the area of risk management for cultural heritage, contributing to the development of new methodologies and tools, capacity building, research, awareness, advice, and dissemination. Wow. So he has several publications on this subject. And after uh, 10 years in his host country, Brazil, he's back in Rome and he'll talk about his latest discoveries there. So it's an honor for me to introduce you, Jose Luis. Welcome to the Silk Now conference and please go ahead. Good morning, sorry for the, the delay. And uh, thank you very much, Ma, for the introduction. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you here today in this, uh, this important conference. A warm greetings from Rome to everyone, wherever you are in the world. So um, my presentation will be about this new initiative that we launched this year at ICROM. It's called Our Collections Matter and it has to do with enabling sustainability through heritage collections and their conservation. Uh, allow me first to say a few words about ICROM, for those of you who don't know it. It's the International Center for the Study of the Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property. It's an intergovernmental organization, currently with 137 members around the world. We are very proud to have all the European Union Union countries as our member states. And here are the youngest and the oldest members of the family, Austria and Latvia, respectively. And then with a special thanks also to our host country today for this event, Spain, that joined the family in 1958. The mission of ICROM is to provide its member states with the best tools, knowledge, skills, and enabling environment with which to preserve their cultural heritage in all its forms, tangible, intangible, movable, and immovable, for the benefit of all people. So our core business has to do with conservation and meaningful use of heritage for uh, the benefit of society. And for this presentation, for the context of today's uh, event, I'd like to draw your attention to one of our strategic objectives, that you see on the screen. It has to do with fostering emerging issues of cultural heritage and conservation through providing innovative and effective response to these emerging issues, such as the interlinkage of nature and culture and sustainable development. And this, this is where the, this initiative, Our Collections Matter, stems from, and, and it's relevant for today's uh, discussion is the linkage between heritage collections and sustainable development. And it stems from ICROM's mission and strategic objectives. So I'd like to start by having a look at the panorama or the ecosystem of collections-based uh, uh, heritage organizations and their communities of users. When I say collections-based organizations, 
I'm referring to museums, libraries, archives, cultural center, etc. So uh, organizations that are responsible for taking care, managing, and providing access to heritage collections. And here's a, an example of the different types of communities these, that these uh, organizations serve. And then since uh, a while now, over a decade now, we have been talking about in the sector and beyond sustainable development or sustainability. You know, you have currently the, the most prominent uh, thing in the horizon are the sustainable development goals or the SDGs of the United Nations 2030 agenda. So that's something that's been uh, significantly uh, spoken about, especially now that we are entering the decade to deliver these goals, no, between 2020 and 2030. But then uh, as we go around and talk to collections managers or the colleagues in these organizations that are in charge of uh, providing access and taking care of this collection, we understand there's still a significant uh, gap. So the whole policy and uh, discussion about sustainable development feels still too abstract for the colleagues on the ground dealing directly with the collections. And that's where this initiative I mentioned, and I would be talking about it today, um, uh, enters the scene, not to bridge the gap between managing and conserving and providing access to collections on the ground, and how can this be linked to the sustainable development goals or to sustainability in general in a very practical way. So the goal of this initiative is to enable these collections-based organizations to make concrete contributions towards sustainable development through meaningful use and conservation of their heritage collections. So to take it from the abstract level, not so clear, to make it very concrete and practical. And here we are looking at all the different spheres of sustainability or the five Ps, if you want, no people, planet, profit, partnerships, and peace. So we want to tackle, to unlock the potential of heritage collections to tackle and make a, a concrete con contributions toward these different areas. How are we going to do that? So we have a strategic approach, and this is the triple T, if you want. So we want to provide the tools, you know, very concrete uh, methods and, and uh, uh, methodologies that will allow organizations who work with collection to make this concrete uh, concrete uh, contribution towards sustainability. So we want to develop, compile, and make these tools accessible. We want then to train the organizations to build capacity across the world and across the different types of collections-based organizations to use these tools and use their collections towards sustainability. And then we want to promote a big uh, wave of transformation to promote the use of these heritage collections to unlock their potential around the world, to transform the world in view of the vision of the UN 2030 agenda, leaving no one behind. So this is the approach. And uh, the, the initiative started now in 2020. And the first thing we are working on are the tools. And for that, we are looking at a, our collections method toolkit with this, as I said, no very concrete and practical methods and tools that heritage-based, uh, collections-based organizations can use to make concrete contributions towards sustainability. So we are currently carrying out desk research to identify tools and gaps. We are also running a survey internationally to ask uh, collections-based organizations and professionals who work with collections if they can help us identify existing tools and also gaps for future research and development. Uh, we will re run, uh, starting next year, a series of field studies in situ, you know, so that we can try out these tools. And the idea is to create, at the end, a web-based and open access toolkit where everybody can go and look for tools and understand what they do. And to that end, I'll just give you a, a preview and this is still a prototype of what this, this uh, web-based interface would look like 
This could be, for instance, the landing page, where if you are a museum or an archive or another organization that deals with collection, and you are interested to work towards sustainability, so where can you start? So you can start, for instance, at the five Ps. So I'm interested in planet or environmental aspects or in peace building through collection. So you can choose there. You can choose by uh, individual SDGs, as you can see here on the bottom right. So I'm interested, for instance, in climate action or in uh, uh, zero hunger or quality education. So how, how, what, is, what are the existing tools that can enable me to do things concretely towards that end using collections or through specific activities that the, um, the manager or the organization might be more particularly interested in. So once you filter there, for instance, let's look at prosperity. So we'll be taken to a directory of uh, documented, you know, well-documented in a structural way, methods and tools that can be used to, to uh, work with collections to advance you know, uh, that sphere and make concrete action. And here is just an example, you know, a selection of tools, what it's going to look like. So they'll get a selection of the tools that concern, for instance, in this case, prosperity, and then you can look at each one of them individually. Here on the screen, you get a short summary explaining what the tool does, and then you can explore it further and be directed to the step-by-step -step methodology or um, uh, application. And we want to try out some of these tools, as I said, next year, and continue to develop and populate this, uh, this web-based tool together with everyone. And that is why, and I think, I mean, this is very important. I, we believe that Silk Now you know, is going to be a fantastic tool and contribution in this, uh, in, in this initiative, you not know, to link Silk-based heritage with creative industries and innovation. So this is exactly the, the type of synergy that we are looking for to unlock the potential of heritage collections of all types you know, and, and all, uh, throughout the world. So I think, and we are very happy to be partnering with the University of Valencia uh, to uh, to enforce this this partnership, bringing Silk now into our collections method toolkit and working with it also beyond Europe. So we're using the model also to to replicate elsewhere. And we by doing that, we are already targeting the the 17th Sustainable Development Goal of partnering. Besides that. We want to, uh, as I said, ECROM serves uh, member states all around the world. So we are weaving a global network of partners you know, to help us and work together with us to uh, develop the toolkit, but also to do the field studies and see how these tools work well or need improvement and refinement in different uh, contexts, geographically and culturally, and then come together to generate a comprehensive multilingual uh, toolkit and, and then proceed with the capacity building and then promoting this transformation of the world through uh, heritage collections. So this is the, the first members of the network. So we chose them strategically in terms of geographic distribution, but also in terms of typology of the organization. We have libraries, museums, archives, universities, so very diverse, uh, innovative hubs so we want to bring all of this interdisciplinary, diverse team together to make a, a transformative change. Again, just coming back to the core business of ICRM, in order to do all of that, it's crucial that the collections are in good shape and they are readily accessible for use. And here is where you know, the, all of this effort, it has to be underpinned by conservation of collections. And that's where uh, Ikram also brings in his core expertise to enable that. And a, a second aspect I would like to highlight is that conservation solutions themselves in the organizations in terms of climate control or use of materials, etc., they must be uh, sustainable themselves. And we are also going to look into that as we develop the, this initiative. Before I finish, I'd just like to quickly walk you through 
a uh, international survey that we did at, at the beginning, just pre-launching the Collections Matter Initiative in 2009, where we asked people around the world, different professions, different age groups, every country, to imagine a world without heritage collections. So imagine no more libraries or archives or museums or no more treasured artifacts in temples or cultural center, communities, etc. We ask them to share with us how big a difference would that make in their lives. And quickly, I'd like to share the, the reply we got with you. So this is a just a distribution of number of uh, people who replies so around 2,400 uh, replies from 102 countries, and the survey, we asked that in 22 different languages. This is just the age distribution of the respondents. And here's what they said. So over 90% of everybody, again, different ages, different countries, they said not having collections would have at least a large impact on their lives. And the options were, as you can see here, between huge, very large, large, medium, small, very small, and not. In other words, because within the heritage sector, we, we are sure and we keep saying that collections are important, but in other words, people in general, society in general, no, even in today's fast-changing world, they care a lot about heritage collections for different reasons, because it's a source of well-being, identity and belonging, of knowledge and understanding of others, knowledge about the past and history, but also a source of livelihood and a meaningful reference and inspiration for the future. And, and this is our evidence that uh, our collections really do matter and, and, and that sustains, you know, the, the gives us strength to carry on with this uh, initiative. And again, we are very happy to, to partner with, uh, with Silk now for this very important aspect of sustainability. And here I conclude my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll be glad to discuss it further and answer any questions that you have. So thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, sorry, <laughs> I wasn't here. Thank you so much for your presentation. It was quite, quite interesting. So uh, I don't know if we have any questions, but in any case, I think uh, I really like the part of sustainable development and especially how people have this feeling of um, belonging to something and getting inspired thanks to collections. And I think this is something that here in Sydney now we are really trying to to do so i don't know if any from our audience someone has any questions uh i don't know i actually have one uh i don't know how if any museum can be part of this or i don't know how can we if i am a museum how can we access this this part oh now we're having <laughs> questions sorry so i don't know you want to answer this one or I'll give you the other ones. <laughs> well, I mean, that's a, a quick one. So, of course, it's all about the partnerships. And, and I think the more concretely, it will be through the, the participation of the museums or different types of organizations in the field test, uh, as I said. So this first uh, phase. So if you go to the ICRAM website, or if you type our collections matter, if you Google it, so it will be directed to a... a a, a web article where the project is outlined and at the end there's an email where you can write us within that article uh, uh, expressing your interest to participate and we'll sure get back to you with concrete ways we can uh, we can advance that right so we have another another question it says like if you are addressing particularly the needs of smaller institutions and collections? Yes, the idea is to serve all. Normally, the big and richer ones, they are already doing something because they have the resource. So of our main goal is to leave no one behind. And the idea with the two kids, you know, open access is to really put it out there for everyone, big and small, with different types of collections, different contexts, so everybody will be able to find something 
also depending on what the mandate of the organization is or their particular interests. But the idea is to, to cover the whole diversity, and especially the medium and small ones, you know, which, uh, which normally have to do with, uh, with limited, limited resources. So we want to yeah, leave no one behind. I can hear that. And finally, finally, we have another question. It's, this is, I don't know, I think you already mentioned, but uh, how specifically how collections are promoting or can promote sustainable development? So that's exactly our question to start with in the whole project. And the, as we are prospects, so the, the first thing we are doing, we are looking around, you know, as I said, through desk research and also through consultations to see what's happening and what methods and tools are available in the different sectors. It can be from the very operation of the organization so that it wants to decarbonize through improved use of materials and energy, etc. But also, and, and this is, uh, I think, is where we want to focus, how can we do activities using collections you know, with the communities that the organization serve to, to make change, to make behavioral change? And that could be through climate action, that could be, for instance, through social inclusion, so intergenerational dialogue or discussion, including like a migrant population mediated through collections. And as with Silk now, so how can we engage the creative industries and create synergies between the heritage and innovation? So we're going to look at all these different uh, spheres. We have started to collect specific methods and tools. Right now we have over 60 that will, will make them available in the toolkit and it will continue to grow. And then uh, after that, we will start to engage and work directly with the, with collections-based organizations to build capacity. In other words, to make sure everybody's ready to use the tools or to develop new tools, you know, to really make meaningful use of the collections, to bridge that gap. And I think every, many people here will, will uh, that will resonate with many of the colleagues here. There's a lot of talk about sustainability, but it still feels very abstract. And we want to bridge that gap. So that's our goal. That's great. And do you have any gender-based aspect in within this huge sustainable? Sure, I mean, gender-based uh, gender balance is one. You no, know, in there is one of the SDGs or their objectives. So yeah, I cannot recall any specific method and tools, but I think gender-based uh, uh, sustainability. It's, it's throughout. I mean, every activity should uh, strive not to, mm -hmm. to have uh, gender balance, but there will be specific ones as well. But again, we, are, we started to scan mm -hmm. and uh, we are learning you know, in the different, different parts of the world what's going on. They're very uh, interesting initiatives, but we're still compiling them and understanding and structuring them in a systematic way so that we can, they can be readily accessible and easy to recognize, like if I'm a natural history museum, I'm interested in this aspect of sustainability, I can easily, easily go there and find you know, the type of tool that will match my type of collection, my context, and my interests. And as I said, the next step will be to kind of create hubs or a big wave of uh, uh, raising awareness. So encouraging every collection-based organization to do that and then with the toolkit and, and build capacity to kind of you know in, in the staff, in the colleagues to work with the collection to make it happen. Great. And here we, I have another one question here. Wow, well, three. <laughs> that if, could you give some more information about some of those 60 tools you just mentioned? <laughs> okay, so I can do Every, a couple of them I remember. So one, for instance, uh, several of them, for instance, have to do with how to improve uh, um, use of energy for climate control and storage. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a big thing. And this is, has to do with the way the organizations operate. The other one is a tool that's been developed by ECROM. It's called Reorg, to reorganize and make your storage accessible for the public. So public can have access to to uh, collections, 
No, and even with community, you can engage the community in reorganizing the storage. There's another one that deals with, uh, as I said, so intergenerational dialogue. You no, know, like the the elderly, the talking to the children, but through collections to 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 ensure social inclusion. Also bringing in migrant populations. So you can mediate that kind of discourse through collection. And then the Silk Now, for instance, very uh, direct example, where you can use you know, Silk-based heritage to bring in uh, and, and liaise with creative industries to bring in uh, prosperity, new jobs, and, and development around this area. So social, environmental, economic. Uh, so there are several tools from library to uh, decrease impoverishment so uh, yeah i'll soon i'll soon it will be available but uh these are these are some of the examples i can remember now <laughs> great so in this sense let me make a little bit of um self-promotion <laughs> that tomorrow actually in the morning session we'll have two fashion designers and uh, one teacher from a design school who actually we gave a, a lecture to them and then the students created something inspired in Silk Heritage in museum's collection. So this is a, a nice example. So I finished with my self-promotion. And finally, the last question that I wanted to ask you and then maybe I can leave you. Uh, if, do you think digital humanities can make change, can be part of this sustainable development change? Definitely. And I think we should unite, I mean, the, the heritage sector, culture sector, we have to go together as, as a strong and concerted movement instead of not working in silos or not being so well connected. I think we have to join forces because... That's how we're going to make the change happen. And I think, I mean, it's important that we want to unlock the potential of this, this heritage and, and to, to make behavioral change in society. So we, I think people look up to museums, libraries, archives, or to, to heritage. And uh, I think so far it's been a bit passive. So I, mm -hmm. we, I, the idea should be uh, well aware of the potential of this heritage, work together and be proactive, so that we, as a sector, you know, we can uh, we can we can make uh, transformation, we can change behaviors, and I think that's how sustainability is going to happen, you not know, through behavioral change. And I think heritage and the digital humans, the whole sector, we have a, a huge potential to do so. And, and so far, it's not been very effectively uh, used. And we want to, to encourage that, you know, starting, for instance, with, with this initiative. But the idea, I think, is to work together to unlock the, the potential of heritage for this, uh, for this transformation. Yeah, well, uh, actually, I think uh, the COVID-19 crisis showed us that cultural heritage and culture in the broader sense Actually, it's meaningful for our, for our lives. Everyone, we, we were at our homes watching music, theater, going to the museums from from our sofas because we need actually we need culture. So I think this is a a great step to go. Yes. I don't know if we so have just one. I think I think that that survey it, it, that I showed at the end it just enforced that know that people care yeah. about heritage. And, and uh, just going beyond our sector bubble, so we ask people around the world, and that's an amazing response we have, that it, it matters. And again, the one last thing I'd like to, for those colleagues and uh, uh, public who is watching you today, if you have any concrete methods and tools, any contribution you'd like to share with us in terms of you know, ways through which collections can be used effectively to promote sustainability, please let us know. So we'll, we'll be very thankful. And I think the more we hear and, and collect and share, you know, the stronger this, this movement will be. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. So I think that's it. Uh, let me double check. Oh, no. Uh, I think we already answered this one. Like, how come... How my museum can be part of this initiative? I think we already answered that one. 
So I think we don't have any more questions. So thank you very much, uh, Jose Luis, for being here. It was our pleasure and an honor to have you here and to have Iram. And I think I, I feel really, really appreciated. So I invite you to stay tuned. And we have the next session. I think it begins in 15 minutes. So we will change PowerPoints on this things due to COVID and well, <laughs> thank you very much. And the next session begins at 10.45 and I think that's it.
Hello, welcome back everyone. So after this coffee break and um, with this first note, with this keynote speaker that was amazing and who talked about sustainability in the cultural heritage field, uh, we turn to the Sicilian field and I have the immense pleasure to present two of my dearest colleagues, Giorgia Lo Cicero and Maurizio Bella. Both are from Università degli Studi di Palermo um, they both are part of Silk Now project, so I'm very happy to have them here. And they are going to talk about the Tessuti Meriti dai Musei Ecclesiastiche della Sicilia Orientale. Uh, and I'm very sorry because I completely forgot my my Italian. <laughs> so, scusami l'audienza per il mio italiano, ma l'ho dimenticato. Allora, il professore Vitella, he is an associate professor of history of modern art at the Department of Cultures and Society of the University of Palermo. He holds a PhD in Industrial Design, Figurative and Applied Arts at the Milan Polytechnic. He has served as an art historian at the Regional Superintendents for Cultural Heritage of Trapani. And he has carried out the role of Deputy Director Librarian at the Fardelina Libra Library. And currently he's a professor um, at the University of Palermo he is a researcher in decorative arts, especially in sacred goldsmith and, of course, textiles. And um, I'm going to introduce my colleague, Georgia, Georgia Lo Cicero. She has a degree in art history of the Universidad de Palermo, who, where she also obtained two uh, master degrees in history and technology of goldsmith. And she holds a PhD in architecture, arts and planning. So from between 2012 and 2015, she had several collaborations with the Archaeological Museum of Seville here in Spain. And since 20, 2017, she has been a lecturer in history of modern art. And both are part of uh, this amazing project called Silk Now. <laughs> and please welcome both and the floor is yours. Thank you. Gracias, buongiorno, grazie mille, grazie per questa presentazione. Eh, parleremo in italiano, scusate se non adottiamo un linguaggio che può essere compreso da tutti, ma credo che il nostro eh, italiano parlato lentamente possa essere compreso da tutti. E, e grazie al, al team Silk Now, grazie per aver inserito il nostro intervento oggi, primo dicembre, il giorno in cui celebriamo eh, San Eligio, il patrono delle arti decorative, dell'argenteria e quindi anche un po' degli studiosi eh, di tessuto. L'argomento che ehm, andiamo a proporre ehm, prende le mosse dalla eh, catalogazione che abbiamo effettuato eh, per implementare i dati eh, del progetto eh, Silk Now. Eh, condivido lo schermo ecco e, in particolare grazie agli accordi che abbiamo eh, sottoscritto con delle istituzioni museali della Sicilia orientale eh, e in particolare col Museo Diocesano di Catania con il Museo della Basilica di San Sebastiano di Acirreale e con il Museo della Basilica di San Giorgio di Ragusa, abbiamo avuto eh, la possibilità eh, di accedere a delle collezioni eh, molto interessanti che hanno riservato eh, delle, delle sorprese, eh, soprattutto per quanto riguarda la quantità e anche la qualità dei tessuti eh, che eh, sono conservati all'interno di queste istituzioni. Eh, quella che vedete è la Basilica di San Sebastiano di Acireale, al cui interno è un museo dove sono esposti alcuni tessuti, ma gran parte della loro collezione è custodita all'interno degli armadi eh, della sacrestia. Il Museo Diocesano di Catania, che è annesso alla cattedrale, eh, alla cattedrale di Sant'Agata, eh, dove anche qui eh, una eh, esposizione museale di manufatti tessili, ma anche una eh, grande quantità di manufatti custoditi nei depositi e ancora questa la eh, Basilica di San Giorgio di Ragusa, anche qui all'interno un museo 
che eh, contestualizza arti decorative, argenterie, eh, oreficerie, anche pittura e eh, manufatti essili, ma anche qui un ricco deposito che è quello che rispetto a tutti gli altri ha riservato le maggiori sorprese, anche perché eh, ci muoviamo in una zona, quella della Sicilia orientale, che nel 1693 è stata annientata e distrutta da un terribile terremoto. E si pensava che poco o nulla fosse sopravvissuto di testimonianze precedenti, ma questo tipo di catalogazione condotta sul campo in maniera diretta e così capillare ha riservato invece importanti sorprese e che eh, ci pongono di fronte a delle collezioni di manufatti che riusciamo a datare anche alla prima metà del Cinquecento e quindi testimonianze sopravvissute a questa calamità naturale che ha eh, completamente ambientato eh, il Val di Noto. Per procedere a questa catalogazione eh, ci siamo avvalsi eh, di un eh, programma informatico che è stato utilissimo per interfacciare i dati utili a noi storici dell'arte con i linguaggi di macchina per gli informatici. E per spiegare questa metodologia cedo la parola a Giorgia eh, che si è occupata di implementare appunto queste schede. Prego Giorgia. Grazie. Ok, ehm, quello che mi preme sottolineare è che grazie appunto al progetto Silk Now si è potuto collaborare anche con eh, dipartimenti differenti dal nostro che eh, il cultura e società. In questo caso abbiamo fatto una collaborazione con il Dipartimento di Ingegneria e in particolare con la professoressa Valeria Seidita e il dottor Francesco Lanza che ci hanno aiutato a realizzare questa, questo piccolo programma interfaccia, un'interfaccia digitale per la catalogazione dei tessuti. E innanzitutto abbiamo voluto utilizzare i canoni di catalogazione del SIETA, ovvero del Centro Internazionale per gli Studi del Tessuto Antico, che ha sede a Lyon, come molti di voi sapete, proprio al Museo per la Storia del Tessuto. E ci è sembrato fondamentale prendere appunto spunto dalle schede SIETA perché sono quelle eh, globalmente riconosciute come le più complete. Abbiamo realizzato questa interfaccia a, collaborando con uh, il Dipartimento di Ingegneria perché volevamo appunto uno strumento che insieme contenesse le qualità richieste da un catalogatore storico dell'arte, ma anche eh, il fatto di essere smart e facilmente utilizzabile nel mondo informatico, perché tutte queste schede che sono state prodotte eh, grazie al progetto Silk Now, quindi la digitalizzazione di queste schede, serve a inserire questi dati nel grande database che si sta costituendo in questo progetto, un database che contiene tantissimi tessuti e che grazie appunto a questa interfaccia che contiene dei dati eh, molto significativi per la descrizione del tessuto possono essere interconnessi eh, fra di loro. E appunto analizzando la scheda del SIETA abbiamo tenuto alcune voci che per noi sono fondamentali per caratterizzare un, un tessuto. In questo caso eh, abbiamo nella prima voce eh, un numero di riferimento che si riferisce alla scheda del manufatto in generale. E nella seconda stringa il nome che non è altro che la descrizione del manufatto perché appunto questi tessuti possono essere eh, pianete, possono essere paramenti liturgici eh, di eh, differente appunto dimensione. E poi abbiamo la mh, descrizione tecnica che non è altro che la descrizione dell'intreccio fondamentale nei tessuti e la manifattura, eh, perché appunto grazie al riconoscimento del, dell'intreccio e altri dati che il catalogatore storico sta a cogliere, possiamo anche determinare la manifattura che ha prodotto il manufatto. E quindi grazie alla manifattura e a, al riconoscimento dell'intreccio possiamo dare anche una datazione. 
le dimensioni che come vi dicevo sono una caratteristica base del, del manufatto, il luogo di conservazione del, del manufatto o almeno al momento della catalogazione eh, segnaliamo dove, dove è stato conservato, il numero di inventario quando appunto non è assente come nell'esempio eh, sullo schermo e le note, note che sono eh, molto significative per dare un'identità eh, unica al manufatto perché eh, molti manufatti hanno dei dati storici, della, una documentazione o comunque nelle note spesso mh, abbiamo l'opportunità di descrivere i moduli eh, decorativi che caratterizzano questi, questi manufatti. Grazie appunto a queste, mh, questi piccoli dettagli possiamo eh, collegare i, i tessuti fra di loro. Alla fine è importantissima la bibliografia perché quando questi manufatti non, non sono inediti è sempre bene segnalare dove sono stati ehm, eh, studiati, e quindi i testi ehm, eh, oppure i cataloghi e infine in questa casellina eh, dove appunto dell'immagine esce il file, possiamo eh, inserire l'immagine del, del tessuto, eh, ora sta partendo un video che vi fa vedere la simulazione, e, scegliendo l'immagine salviamo poi direttamente questa scheda digitalizzata sul eh, database eh, di SilkNow e poi possiamo appunto scorrere tutte le schede che sono state prodotte e quindi sono facilmente reperibili. Eh, questo ha permesso di poter mh, unire questi, questi tessuti per eh, le caratteristiche fondamentali che possono essere una linea temporale oppure una manifattura simile o delle caratteristiche che eh, possono essere equiparate. Questo è un metodo a mio avviso fondamentale per qualsiasi ricercatore che si approccia allo studio dei, dei tessuti e questo appunto è stato possibile grazie al lavoro eh, comune di, di due dipartimenti che di solito non, non collaborano insieme, in questo caso invece hanno prodotto qualcosa che può servire a tutti noi studiosi. Ti restituisco... Um... Bene, grazie, grazie Giorgio per aver evidenziato questo eh, sistema informatico per eh, poter acquisire i dati e attraverso l'acquisizione dei dati lo studioso poi ha la possibilità eh, di eh, trovare eh, delle, delle novità, di, di approfondire i propri studi, di conoscere eh, come eh, si sono diffusi sul territorio, come si è evoluto il modulo decorativo applicato ai tessili. Ebbene, eh, questa catalogazione che eh, ci ha permesso di accedere a dei depositi eh, che non erano stati prima d'ora eh, sondati o in alcuni casi soltanto parzialmente studiati e sono emerse eh, tante novità, eh, per brevità qui ne espongo soltanto eh, alcune, ho fatto una eh, piccola selezione, a cominciare per esempio eh, dalla testimonianza di un tipico eh, intreccio molto documentato in Sicilia, ragion per cui pensiamo che eh, sia un tipo di intreccio realizzato nella nostra regione, che è il taftà lanciato alle, agli Age Repri, un metodo molto semplice perché da un intreccio base, qual è l'intreccio tela, l'intreccio taftà, e con l'aggiunta di una sola trama, una trama lanciata, si ottengono degli effetti di disegno molto interessanti che spaziano dalla tipologia a girale eh, a quella invece che eh, comprende la cosiddetta tulipanomania o la natura morta che si afferma in pieno Seicento con questo gusto per eh, gli elementi floreali, per gli elementi botanici. E, e solitamente la trama eh, lanciata è una eh, trama laminata, una, eh, un, un argento filato eh, per cui si ha anche la possibilità di rendere preziosi questi manufatti 
con il tipico effetto di rifrangenza che crea appunto il filato metallico. Ma eh, vi dicevo che questo eh, tipo di catalogazione, soprattutto per l'ambito geografico dove è stato condotto sia la Sicilia orientale e la Sicilia sud orientale, ha riservato delle interessanti eh, novità e scoperte proprio perché si pensava che in quelle zone non fossero sopravvissute quelle testimonianze precedenti al sisma del 1693. E questo è stato smentito proprio dall'aver ritrovato questi damaschi a grandi rapporti, damaschi che tra l'altro per la loro eh, preziosa eh, fibra con cui sono realizzati, cioè la seta, hanno goduto di una particolare attenzione tanto da essere riutilizzati nel XIX secolo come testimonia l'applicazione di questo gallone cucito a macchina che è tipico del XIX secolo. Il tessuto invece ci documenta quella produzione di damaschi a grande rapporto con la ehm, gestione delle maglie geometriche, le cosiddette maglie romboidali, campite ora dalla melagrana, ora dal vaso fiorito, oppure con la stilizzazione floreale. Ebbene, questo oltre a documentare un tipo di produzione eh, del XVI secolo, ci mette anche di fronte a quella diffusione in ambito mediterraneo di tessuti molto probabilmente realizzati in ambito toscano, come è possibile che siano questi due, il fatto poi di trovare l'elemento araldico con la corona ci rimanda proprio ad una tipologia di produzione che eh, era eh, molto praticata in ambito eh, toscano, mentre questa eh, mh, eh, questo modulo più semplificato e anche eh, poco netto eh, nella eh, lettura, nelle impostazioni eh, del decoro, eh, dove l'effetto eh, tipico del Damasco, ossia eh, il cangiante tra il lucido e l'opaco, risulta meno evidente, è probabile che sia stato realizzato in Sicilia, dove le maestranze non erano particolarmente abili e ehm, qualificate come quelle invece della, eh, ehm, eh, della zona eh, toscana. E ancora continuando, altri damaschi eh, sempre con eh, l'elemento eh, geometrico del, della maglia che campisce il vaso, vaso da cui eh, si aprono tutta una serie di racemi che si estendono eh, lungo tutto il tessuto. O ancora eh, un'altra eh, tipologia di decoro che qui è condotta in maniera più, eh, eh, più composta e più piccola, dove eh, appunto le, le maglie romboidali si sono rimpicciolite e comincia a comparire anche quell'elemento decorativo che nel gergo degli studiosi di tessuto viene chiamato l'elemento ammazza, eh, che si impone poi eh, nella, alla fine del Cinquecento e agli inizi del Seicento. Quindi attraverso queste acquisizioni eh, di eh, documenti tessili ancora una volta abbiamo l'opportunità di poter costruire e ricostruire quella evoluzione dei moduli decorativi propri eh, dei tessuti e questo eh, ci viene anche permesso da altri ritrovamenti eh, come queste eh, tre pianete realizzate con tre tipologie di tessuti che documentano l'evoluzione del gusto nel Settecento. L'elemento eh, decorativo bizzarro che è tipico della eh, produzione tessile di inizio Settecento il eh, modulo decorativo eh, a cosiddetto revel dal eh, nome del tessitore che ha eh, inventato questo effetto pittorico della gestione delle trame broccate e il modulo a meandro. Eh, sono eh, tre testimonianze, tutte e tre 
eh, inedite, eh, viste eh, per la prima volta, cu custodite nel Museo della Basilica di San Giorgio di Ragusa, che ci mettono anche di fronte a delle tecniche di lavorazione, quale eh, per esempio il damasco broccato o ancora eh, il eh, taftà broccato o come eh, quest'ultima il eh, taftà li sarei broccato. Eh, quindi mh, tre eh, tipi diversi di montaggio di un telaio che danno vita a delle produzioni molto ricche, sontuose e probabilmente utilizzate per dei costumi civili e poi, come era in uso in Sicilia, donate alla Chiesa che ne hanno trasformato il prezioso tessuto in paramento sacro. E ancora eh, ci si conferma anche l'uso di ispirarsi eh, alle produzioni realizzate a telaio, perché l'elemento bizarro, il decoro bizarro, realizzato appunto con il telaio manuale, come attesta questa pianeta custodita nel ehm, Museo della Basilica di San Sebastiano, serve come modello di ispirazione per riprodurre i disegni astratti e così eh, fantasiosi con la tecnica del ricamo e diventa una caratteristica della produzione tessile siciliana, tra l'altro propongo proprio queste due eh, pianete perché sono stati ritrovati i documenti di commissione e anche l'inventario di quando questi eh, due eh, eh, abiti sacri giungono a Catania. Eh, si tratta di due abiti sacri appartenuti al vescovo Galletti, di cui eh, compare appunto il suo stemma, e sono stati realizzati tra il 1729 e il 1730. Quindi la indagine sul campo, eh, insieme anche alla ricerca archivistica, eh, danno l'opportunità di poter ricostruire il contesto di produzione e il contesto anche di proprietà eh, di questi magnifici manufatti e aver potuto effettuare queste catalogazioni per Silky Now è stato eh, sicuramente stimolante, è stata un'esperienza eh, che ci ha permesso di entrare in contatto con delle collezioni eh, poco conosciute e inedite e che mettiamo a disposizione della comunità internazionale. Vi ringrazio per l'attenzione e vi aspettiamo in Sicilia. Grazie. Grazie, thank you very much. Oui, sorry. <laughs> no. Grazie a tutti e due, Grazie. è stato meraviglioso e parlerò in inglese <laughs> perché veramente ho dimenticato l'italiano. Io ho abitato a Roma due anni e l'ho dimenticato. <laughs> ok, so, and I feel more comfortable speaking in English. In any case, um, ok, wow. You have a lot of things here. Um, well, they are thanking you about the, the great job you did. And um, I wanted to ask you, like, well, they already asked you and I saw that Georgia answer, but uh, I really want to go here. It was complicated to, to, to introduce the Sieta uh, catalog, type of catalog into a informatic system was it complicated was it easy because i know the sieta is wow really really complete so how was this interdisciplinary work beh sicuramente non è semplice eh, riuscire a far eh, combaciare i dati e di una scheda del SIETA con un programma informatico. E nella mappatura che è stata fatta di eh, alcune schede che abbiamo fornito, abbiamo riscontrato la eh, peculiarità che ciascun storico dell'arte dà delle personali interpretazioni nel momento in cui descrive 
eh, il modulo decorativo, il cosiddetto depiction, come l'abbiamo definito nelle nostre schede. Quindi eh, non è soltanto un problema di trovare eh, un collegamento tra eh, ciò che produce lo storico dell'arte e quello che eh, serve per il linguaggio di macchina, per il linguaggio informatico, ma qui si tratta anche di trovare una formula univoca con cui si descrivono questi oggetti e non sempre è facile perché eh, nel caso eh, della descrizione di un tessuto bizarro dove ci sono eh, delle eh, fantasie astratte e eh, magari eh, io vedo oh, un elemento che somiglia a un fiore e qualcun altro vede un elemento che somiglia a non so cosa ad un, ad un, ad un animale mostruoso e non so come sì. dire quindi è un problema che si pone eh, per poi trovare un equilibrio eh, tra ciò che si vuole eh, far emergere in una descrizione e quello che riesce a comprendere il linguaggio di macchina di un informatico. Eh, questo è stato uno dei problemi che eh, abbiamo cercato di superare per far sì che una scheda sieta potesse transitare in un linguaggio informatico. Il fatto poi di avere scelto una formula eh, sintetica, come quella che ci è stata realizzata eh, grazie alla collaborazione con il Dipartimento di Ingegneria e con ehm, la collaborazione con la professoressa Seidita, abbiamo cercato appunto di mediare eh, queste problematiche. Non so se sono stato chiaro nella sì, risposta. Chiarissimo, anche io no. Allora io ho una domanda, voi avete eh, due catalogazioni, una sieta e una unicamente informatica? E sto pensando nel museo o in, in, la, in la chiesa, perché no, non è lo stesso questo che noi abbiamo necessità come, come progetto e come catalogazione, come storico dell'arte che noi siamo, allora come è, com è stato? Perché questo che, che, tu hai, che lei ha detto di... Del, museo, del tessuto bizarro, dei tessuti bizarri, è, è certo, è tantissime, tantissime cose, allora co come li, li dice in una scheda informatica? Allora, allora, per una catalogazione ufficiale che eh, viene anche eh, gestita eh, dalle istituzioni pubbliche, come può essere una soprintendenza o come anche gli stessi uffici dei beni culturali, eh, delle, delle curie e delle diocesi, eh, si cerca di adottare eh, quel sistema informatico dove sono comprese la maggior parte delle voci previste dalla scheda sieta. Il problema è che non sempre però i catalogatori che vengono reclutati hanno delle capacità di, di conoscenza e di studio eh, e riescono a eh, rispondere a tutti i quesiti che pongono queste schede. Noi nei musei in cui siamo intervenuti abbiamo prodotto noi stessi per la prima volta queste schede, tanto che le mettiamo a disposizione della stessa istituzione. Negli accordi che abbiamo preso Abbiamo eseguito questo tipo di catalogazione, ma non soltanto per una nostra utilità finalizzata a Silk Now, anche per poter fornire ai musei questo tipo di lavoro. Quindi ci siamo mossi in questo modo. Grazie. E anche una domanda. Allora, eh, buongiorno, vorrei fare una domanda. Gli elementi tessili liturgici ad esempio le pianete sono mai state usate posteriormente per la confezione di costumi tradizionali, cioè riapprofittate. Eh, beh, di solito le, le, le pianete hanno un insito valore sacrale eh, che non consentono né l'alienazione né tantomeno il riutilizzo per altre cose che non interferiscono nell'ambito sacrale. Al contrario, l'abito civile donato o il tessuto di tapezzeria donato alla Chiesa subisce un riuso, una, eh, un adattamento 
alle finalità religiose. Uh, grazie. Allora, un'altra domanda. Eh, enhorabuena per il lavoro. Come e dove si possono consultare le fiche tecniche? Ui. Come si consulta la, 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 la scheda tecnica? Eh, beh, eh, ci vogliono delle competenze specifiche. Eh, per eh, consultare una scheda tecnica eh, bisogna avere eh, conoscenza con quelli che sono i principali intrecci eh, che vengono utilizzati nella tessitura tradizionale. Ed ecco che qui eh, il, la nostra piattaforma Silk Now potrà sicuramente fornire un uh, aiuto e eh, un elemento di supporto importante. Y en, en este sentido, eh, hay una pregunta que va por, por esta línea, que pregunta, aunque yo ya la he contestado, dice, ¿estos tejidos están abiertos al público? Y le decía, la investigación fue complicada. I tessuti che ho catalogato nella maggior parte sono esposti al pubblico. Sono, eh, allora, I musei in cui ci siamo mossi per la catalogazione hanno delle collezioni esposte al pubblico, ma quelle che vi ho proposto oggi nella, eh, nelle slide, nel PowerPoint, sono eh, tessuti custoditi nei depositi, non sono visibili al pubblico. <risa> eh, la investigación, la investigación fue, fue complicada. Nos preguntan si tuvisteis muchos problemas durante la investigación a la hora de catalogar, de comparar, de, de descubrir nuevos tejidos. Eh beh, sí, certo, porque eh, oltre ai problemi burocratici di accesso alla consultazione di queste collezioni. Eh, nel momento in cui si effettua lo studio eh, sicuramente il metodo comparativo è il principale eh, ossia paragonare, eh, mettere insieme, confrontare eh, i eh, tessuti che eh, si scoprono per la prima volta con elementi simili già pubblicati, eh, già studiati e quindi trovare quelle affinità, quelle caratteristiche comuni che ti permettono eh, di riuscire a ricostruire un contesto e, e lì bisogna stare molto attenti nel eh, guardare i dettagli, i particolari, ma anche lo stesso conteggio del numero di fili eh, che effettia, eh, si effettua con eh, l'utilizzo di eh, questo strumento che è il contafili, eh, permette eh, di eh, raggiungere delle conoscenze che possono essere utili appunto ad una eh, contestualizzazione geografica, eh, cronologica eh, del tessuto che si sta studiando. Eh, posso aggiungere una cosa? Sì, sì. Eh, ho visto Perfetto. che eh, il nostro pubblico è molto interessato a queste schede tecniche. Io eh, vorrei invitare tutti, a, eh, una volta che il progetto sarà concluso e tutte queste schede saranno disponibili, noi abbiamo degli strumenti che aiutano la didattica, perché grazie al Virtual Loom possiamo andare a vedere questi intrecci nel dettaglio e quindi se poi magari eh, uno vuole studiare un, un tessuto che sta in Sicilia però non puoi spostarti, grazie al Virtual Loom puoi studiare l'intreccio di quel tessuto. Poi eh, c'è un altro strumento didattico molto valido che è appunto il nostro Tesaurus. Eh, la ragazza di prima chiedeva eh, come mai si sono scelti alcuni termini e insomma se è difficile capire una scheda tecnica. Grazie al Tesaurus, uno strumento col Tesaurus, chiunque può approcciarsi al mondo del tessile perché quando io non capisco un termine tecnico della scheda Basta andarlo a cercare sul Tesaurus e riesci a capire che, di che cosa stiamo parlando. Quindi credo che eh, tutti questi tasselli che compongono il nostro eh, progetto insieme possono aiutare chiunque ad avvicinarsi al mondo del tessile e pian piano appunto eh, diventare nel proprio piccolo un po' più esperti nel tessile. Tutto qui. 
No, certo, grazie. And uh, I'm going to change to English a little bit. So thank you very much for this part because it's true. Here we have the thesaurus, which is an amazing tool for learning more about Seal Heritage, the virtual loom. We, yesterday we have both talks about the virtual loom and the thesaurus and how they are great and amazing tools to, to discover the, the yarns and, and how we can approach them. And I think later on we have uh, this artificial intelligence and I think within these days um, our colleagues uh, from Eurocom are going to show us what are the silk is and how we are going to discover all these pieces all together, which is, and um, I really thank you for sharing this. And I have one more question here. Uh, it says, uh, I'd like to ask Professor Vitella and Georgia, what are the main challenges in working with multidisciplinary teams and what are the main benefits for their work? Eh beh, sì, certo, lavorare in questa maniera interdisciplinare eh, ci ha fatto crescere a tutti. Eh, Anch'io ho dovuto imparare eh, eh, per appunto trovare questo equilibrio tra le esigenze dello storico dell'arte e le esigenze di chi si occupa dell'informatica e della digitalizzazione. Eh, è un modo che eh, ci ha permesso di interagire con diverse specialità e eh, ciascuno di noi a mettere a servizio dell'altro le proprie competenze. Quindi è un modo eh, sicuramente di crescita e di accrescere le conoscenze, almeno per quella che è la mia esperienza. E Giorgia, tu vuoi, tu vuoi dire qualcosa? Io, io concordo perché eh, credo che è necessario per poter conservare tutti questi manufatti per il futuro, per i nostri figli, per i nostri nipoti, che i beni culturali siano affiancati alle nuove tecnologie. Eh, e questo appunto è stato importante lavorare in un team così eterogeneo perché eh, spesso lo storico dell'arte guarda soltanto ai propri studi, forse è un po' chiuso nel proprio mondo, però le qualità eh, dello storico dell'arte se affiancate appunto alle qualità di un informatico, come abbiamo visto può produrre degli strumenti che possono aiutare tutti gli studiosi e eh, credo che questo sia lo spirito guida del nostro progetto, del progetto Silk Now, insomma. Grazie, I think we don't have more questions, but actually I want to say like in this sense, We have this previous talk about sustainability regarding cultural heritage. And I think we are on the, on the same path here. We are, you actually made an amazing discovery with all these fabrics and you discover these uh, collections and are, you're going to open them to the world. And I think uh, that's also sustainable development and also is going to be in part uh, where Jorge is going to talk about us later about data interoperability. So I think all these um, the lectures are quite connected and thank you, thank you so much for being here. Uh, grazie per la vostra collaborazione nel nostro progetto. Sono contentissima di essere oggi con voi. Uh, e com Come è? Buon San Eligio, no? San Eligio, San Eloi. <laughs> San Eloi, ah, scusami. San Eloi, eh. Allora, buon giorno a tutti, grazie. E grazie. La prossima... grazie. Grazie. Yeah, grazie. And the next conference uh, begins in, uh, I think it's at 11.30. So we're 11.45. So see you in a minute. So thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye. See you in a few. Grazie, grazie. Voi. Ciao, ciao.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back. And we are on our third th session today. Uh, today's session is now Jorge Sebastián from Universidad de Valencia. He's going to talk about interoperability of online catalogs, some case studies of textile collections. So he's our digital wide master. <laughs> and uh, Jorge Sebastián, he's an assistant professor in the Department of Art History here at the Universidad de Valencia where he teaches on heritage and art history at the graduate and undergraduate levels. He has also been a research fellow in the Real Colegio Complutense at Harvard University in 2017 and 2018. His doctoral dissertation was devoted to female representation in Spanish court art and visual culture during the 16th century, with a number of book chapters and exhibition essays resulting from it. Last year, actually, he collaborated in Sofonis Van Gisola's exhibition in the Museo del Prado. He has also involved in digital humanities initiatives since the early 20s. So I welcome you, Jorge. It's a pleasure to have you here. And I'm sure your presentations will be quite interesting. And actually, it's it goes with all the rest of presentations that we have been having today. So I give you the floor and welcome. Thank you much, Mar. Yes, indeed, this is a nicely woven day. <laughs> all the days in this conference are nicely woven, but today, really, all presentations are very much uh, linked one to each other. I'm sharing my screen. Let me just make sure that everything works properly. So, yes, I, I guess here we are. Okay, so... Um, so um, good morning, welcome, everyone, and thanks for, for being here. As you may notice, I have made a small change in my title, Interoperability of Online Catalogs, period. The case studies, in fact, is our, our, the, the, the presentations of some of our colleagues uh, today, the, like the one we just had from Palermo, but also the, the, the other ones the, the, that you are going to listen to. There are some general comments uh, that I'm going to present here. But the case studies, of course, would take uh, too much time. I think that some of them, some of those consequences and case studies will be published in the resulting proceedings from this conference. But the, again, the substantial idea, so to speak, the diagnosis, the situation is presented here. So uh, let me just begin by uh, asking why. That's always a good question. Or, well, I mean, before we speak about interoperability, one may very well wonder why museums or heritage institutions should be interested in interoperability. In my, in my opinion, this may lead us to a much broader discussion on why they, museums and public collections, should exist at all. That discussion could well start centuries ago with the birth of large national museums across Europe. But don't worry, we will not go that far today. By the way, this discussion does not involve museums only, but all glams, as you will surely know, galleries, libraries, archives, and museums. Anyway, by way of answer, let me just remind now that access to culture is recognized as a basic human right, and that access to information about cultural objects is one of the best ways to protect and preserve them. For today's society, but also for future generations, so that both them and us can enjoy those objects, share our experiences around them, and learn about the people that created or used them. The main reason to, in my opinion, to advocate for interoperability is to increase the accessibility of information about heritage. In Europe alone, our historical objects are kept in thousands of institutions, not to mention historical monuments and built environments or intangible heritage. Such diversity is a wealth to be preserved and enjoyed, but it also poses barriers for an easy discovery and access to objects that were ori originally related, but now are kept in widely different and distant collections and connected to each other. The advent of the internet or the information age and the network society has made this discussion even more poignant for cultural heritage institutions traditionally charged with the task of preserving the memory of the past while making it accessible and understandable for contemporary citizens. 
increasing accessibility to heritage collections, in our case this morning, collections of historical textiles, is a common topic of discussion within GLAMS or within cultural institutions at large. In the last year, a frequent approach to the issue has been the concept of open access. And one may well wonder, as we do in this slide, how open is open access? What is the definition of open? That is in itself a contested topic, but the most widely accepted definition that you see here would take it to refer to a policy or practice that allows reuse and redistribution of materials for any purpose, including commercial ones. Leading, leading examples in this regard come from large museums that have made all or large parts of their holdings, including high quality images, freely available on the web. Those examples will be well known to you. The Rijksmuseum in the Netherlands, the Metropolitan Museum in New York, the Getty in LA, universities such as Yale or Harvard. But what you may ask, is this policy only available for that kind of top tier institutions? Incidentally, I want to say also that some examples indicate that a temporary closing for renovations or other reasons, that was the case of the Rijksmuseum originally, it was an important push to take those decisions of going entirely online or mostly online, making their collections available while various reasons made impossible the physical access to them. To my knowledge, and in the current situation, COVID lockdowns have not yet had this exact exact kind of consequence, a big effort for the massive digitization of collections among other museums. For good reasons, of course, lockdowns were planned and many other issues have been and still are much more pressing for museums today. Adaptation to crisis environments and changing visitor behaviors, however, has now become much more evident as a good reason to invest into digitization and open access to our collections. This discussion is by no means recent nor marginal. The, the important fact here is that small and medium-sized institutions are also adopting ambitious programs of digitization, open access and interoperability for the information about their holdings. And I'm very happy to include here a slide from a recent presentation shown at Europeana 2020 at the, the conference, the annual conference of Europeana some weeks ago. There was a very interesting workshop and presentation on, uh, from members of Open Glam that you are seeing here. Uh, it's an international network of heritage professionals that has been working during the last months to prepare a declaration on open access to cultural heritage. The results of that, can, uh, of that research, of that work, and a continuing campaign are expected for the coming months. So I invite you to log in into this website that you are seeing here, openglam.poopoop.org, uh, to follow this very, very interesting work. But anyway, you see here some of the benefits and challenges involved in, in going for, for open access. And um, this is a very broad discussion, as you can see. But I, for, for this presentation, I will be focusing, among other things, uh, on the benefits of integration into external interfaces, like the ones we'll be showing now, and fostering reuse and remix culture. In any case, the point for my discussion is that once information is digitized, not just the images, but also the, the catalog records, the metadata, once that information is digitized and incorporated into a structured data repository, sharing it across institutions is really at hand in most cases. Instead of only expecting our users to find our website out on the wild, wild west, and by this I mean the, the general search engines that are so competitive <laughs> in, in getting the attention from the, uh, from the users. An additional way to proceed is to aggregate our cataloging records into larger data repositories. As regards textiles, our topic for this conference, if we are dealing with fabrics, fashions, and in general, with material objects of an inherently fragile material condition, 
digital preservation and access seem the best answers. Now, let us compare two approaches through three examples among many available others for this task. Those two approaches that we are going to see now are ad hoc curated content and structured repositories. My example for ad hoc curated content is also surely well known to you. Uh, we, we are culture, vestimos cultura in this screenshot you are seeing. As you will know, <clears throat> it's a <clears throat> resource, a product from Google Arts and Culture. <clears throat> it is an aggregator of, excuse me, it is an aggregator of ad hoc, usually highly curated content. In a way, this is the traditional answer and a very successful one, if done properly. The innovation here, and it's really worth noticing, is bringing together content from almost 200 different institutions and providing it in a compelling way, prioritizing extraordinary photographs and audiovisual content over consistent and extensive documentation. Let's face it, in all likelihood, most non-expert users will feel more attracted to this approach. A pre-selection has been done by each institution and approved by the Google team. However, in terms of discovery of new information or of, or of specific pieces, beyond the, the usual collection highlights, it is fairly limited. Its searching abilities are very, very basic and irregular in results. Google, who no doubt is listening to us at this very moment, would probably answer that user should turn to the general search engine for that purpose. But in any case, if you come to We We Are Culture expecting to do exact searches, uh, you will surely be disappointed. Instead, the structure repositories offer great opportunities for sharing informations, information across institutions. This is the approach that we are dealing with in Silk now, and it offers some advantages and some prospects that are at least worth exploring. First, uh, they involve opportunities for discovery. Large databases can provide, so to speak, windows of visibility for less known pieces, many times kept in storage, and more, even more so with, text, with textile heritage. Objects that are less likely to attract the attention of the general public, but which can be very interesting for other experts or for targeted audiences. In my opinion, this is the main benefit of these repositories, and one that, so to speak, simply, Nothing simple about that, but anyway, simply requires having the cataloging data already available in digital formats, adapting them to existing standards, and sharing them through available repositories. A second advantage is that of workflow optimization. And by this, I mean that information generated primarily for institutional or, or even internal usage can, to a certain extent, not fully, but to a certain extent, be repurposed for later external reuse, instead of incurring the costs of time-consuming one-off curated content publications. Third, multilingualism can also be adequately dealt with through structured repositories. This is, again, complex, uh, but joint efforts, such as the ones uh, carried out in this project are helping to overcome linguistic barriers. Of course, there, always, there is always automated translation, but it does have some limits, mostly in the specialized contexts. Um, in those cases, mm, well, museum catalogs tend to be rather specialized resources that use scholarly, scholarly terminology. Therefore, it will always be better to count on multilingual controlled vocabularies and not just general automated translation. Thus, we can also answer queries from users in different languages and providing answers uh, across, across different languages. Finally, um, I would say there are also opportunities for automatization of some tasks, not all, of course. Large bodies of information, 
for instance, objects covering an entire period or the style, groups of objects covering an entire period or the style, are hard to grasp in their entirety, even for experts. Artificial intelligence, as the next presentation will show, and big data may, might be ready to help us in some cases, where computers can take care of repetitive and cumbersome tasks. For instance, searching for previously unknown shared features or for unexpected patterns within large numbers of objects and records, both in visual analysis and in textual analysis, also called topic modeling. Automated annotation might be a great help for catalogers providing suggestions based on comparison with many other instances and always ensuring that the artificial intelligence generated content is curated and supervised by domain experts. In short, massive shared repositories can help to go beyond the walls of individual institutions of whatever size but they should be particularly useful for smaller museums and collections, such as the ones scattered throughout Europe as memories of the essential roles that textile industries once placed across the continent. Well, my first example of structured repositories is Europeana. Quite surely this audience does not need to be introduced to Europeana. It is one of the largest experiments in open access to culture that the internet has made possible. It works with European archives, libraries, and museums in order to share cultural heritage, providing access to millions of books, music, artworks, and other contents. The important thing here is that Europeana brings together cataloging records and digital surrogates from literally thousands of institutions. This might seem a simple accumulative effort, but far from it. It is a technical feat of data harmonization and interoperability. A large part of it comes from national libraries, printed materials, I mean. But museums and collections of material culture also have an important presence in the repository. It is decentralized in, na in nature, working through national and thematic aggregators as such as some of the ones that you can see in, in the screen, instead of a single data ingestion node, very diverse institutions, regardless of their size, can share their contents and become data providers for Europeana. It is very revealing that one of the first thematic clusters within it was devoted to fashion and costume. Europeana Fashion, whose managing director will speak to us on Friday, currently gathers around 1 million records of cultural objects related to fashion, from catwalk photographs to drawings from the great designers of couture brands. It was born as a research project that later became a network of fashion-related institutions and an aggregator for this kind of contents into, into Europeana. My second example is Wikimedia Commons, uh, a quite a different model. It is the media file repository that hosts public domain and freely licensed media content for the various projects of the Wikimedia Foundation. The, the one that we all know is Wikipedia, but it, this is just one among all those projects. Of course, by far the most used one. This approach is very different to those seen so far. Wikimedia Commons can be used to find images or multimedia of cultural heritage but it is not intended as a direct provider. First, search engines increasingly rely on Wikimedia Commons as the first option in image searches about historical cultural objects. Since most often images uploaded to Wikimedia have little or no intellectual property limitations to their reuse, they get downloaded and copied in ever increasing numbers. In that regard, any cultural institution should ask itself what to do in trying to get visibility for their objects. They could either fight a long and uphill battle to get their own website as the top search result within Google or any search engine, or they may, they may join the enemy, so to speak, and simply make sure that the, enemy sh that, that the image sorry, shown in the Wikipedia is one provided by them, properly referenced 
and link to the owning institutions. The quotation you are reading on the screen is part of a, an article and a report done by a Swedish museum in 2015 that donated, uploaded 20,000 of their images from their collections to Wikimedia Commons. And uh, as you can see, they see many, many advantages. Most of all, the increased reach of their images and the, the way that they have been reused and repurposed within Wikipedia, within articles in Wikipedia. So that combination of the, the, the records, the images, and the articles within Wikipedia has, has become, in their case, a very successful collaboration. This approach can be very useful for the exceptional and well-known pieces that get thousands of hits in search engines, but also for objects who are not yet so prominent, Wikimedia can also be a good springboard into public recognition after photograph or, uh, and its associated metadata are donated, that is uploaded to commons, it can be used in Wikipedia articles and referenced within media categories, such as the one you are seeing now on the screen, the category textiles in a particular donation, the Museum Catalina Convent on the Netherlands. Um, or in other Wikimedia Foundation tools. The owning institutions is properly credited and referenced, and its online catalog is linked back. So you're seeing now that the record, that one of those records within Wikimedia Commons, with quite a lot of information that was uploaded by this institution. And then there is also the possibility to link back to the website of the museum. So, Somehow it all ties together all the entire cycle of the information. In any case, just to make it clear, again, the main advantage, in my opinion, of Wikimedia Commons is the potential visibility that it brings to cultural contents with its massive global reach. As you may know, uh, and according to recent data, Wikipedia, well, all, no, sorry, all of the Wikimedia websites are, get almost 10,000 views per second. Imagine 10,000 views per second. Of course, not all of that is culture, but a substantial part of it is. It is. So why not be there if, with the greatest guarantee? Anyway, so far I have outlined very briefly three global repositories that contain or can contain data about textiles and fashion. My aim was just making clear that digital platforms offer different models for the dissemination of cultural heritage data, particularly about fashion and textiles. Those platforms evolve over time, and in this regard, as in others, Europeana seems the most stable option for any institutions within Europe that want to share information about their collection beyond their own digital websites and resources. In any case, it does not have to be an either-or choice. All approaches can be simultaneously valid for the same institution. And users will surely appreciate the different opportunities they provide, from the cleaner and simpler interface provided by Google to the more flexible and reusable wealth of data from Europeana and or Wikimedia Commons. So coming back to the, our main concept here, interpretability, uh, well, structured data repositories such as the latter two that we have just seen require some interoperability efforts from data providing institutions. The process of transferring the data from different databases into the models of the aggregators involves several tasks that are more thoroughly exemplified in the talks from some of our colleagues in this very conference. For instance, the structure of cataloging records is rarely standard among cultural heritage institutions. Textile collections have been no exception to this proliferation of heterogeneous cataloging schemes. Semantic web tools, however, provide accessible ways to integrate those different resources while losing a minimum amount of detail or data granularity. By semantic web tools, I mean ontologies, conceptual reference models, and knowledge graphs, such as the ones that our partners from Eurecom and Lyon will be presenting this afternoon. On the other hand, data themselves, and not just their structure, need some standardization. This involves, most importantly, terminological consensus. 
even more so in such a specialized field as textile history, with so many weaving techniques and local variants, etc. For a long time, the main terminological tool in this area has been provided by the CETA, the Centre International d'Etudes des Textiles Anciens. I am referring, of course, to their multilingual glossaries of textile vocabulary, whose transition into a digital resource has been in preparation during the last years. A thesaurus is a somewhat different tool, since it involves the establishment of relationships between terms, whether hierarchical, equivalent, or associative. The need for a digital thesaurus of textile terms was the subject of discussion at a general conference of ECOM in 2016. Yesterday, the presentations about the Getty vocabularies uh, and the silk now thesaurus made clear the importance of this, the importance, the difficulty, and the results achieved in this essential area. Again, semantic web technologies are enabling the unified consultation of catalogs in different languages, thanks to multilingual control vocabularies. Considering all those requirements, the next most important thing for museum data interoperability is museum data. In our case, having data about textile historical objects. This is where the quality of cataloging becomes a key issue. In many cases, the specificity of textiles and the high expertise required to describe and analyze them properly have led to superficial, minimal, or simply wrong catalog records. A shared challenge in this process, as in any other interoperability effort, is, again, the extreme heterogeneity of cataloging practices the standards are available for textile objects. Once again, CETA has provided a high quality standard for catalogers over the last decades, as you have already seen in the previous presentation from our colleagues in Palermo. However, it is seldom applied in digital catalogs because of its complexity and specialization. Most museums pre prepare their own reduced version of the CETA record or simply apply an in-house developed alternative, something that, of course, increases heterogeneity. In the opposite scenario, when one museum is not focused only on fabrics or clothing, they usually operate with general data standards that are too unspecific to suit the needs of textile items. This means, for instance, that substantial parts of the most meaningful information, such as weaving techniques, decorative patterns, or styles, many times are stored within general description fields often as plain text, which renders that, re that rich information much harder to use, for instance, to find similarities or matches between objects. So coming to the last part of my presentation, this analysis, sorry, the, the analysis of a specific museum catalogs and some centralized national repositories, such as Joconde or Ceres in Spain, is providing us with yet more insights into the best ways to take advantage of existing data or planning for the creation of new catalogs. Please pay attention to this afternoon's presentations for, those, for some of these insights. Summing up, we advocate interoperability for the reasons you are seeing, uh, interoperability through shared repositories for museums. Um, first, because it ensures the practice of better cataloging and information, the putting into, pr into practice, better cataloging and information management strategies. It also provides opportunities for increased visibility for small and medium-sized institutions that usually do not have a big public profile among the general audience. It, they also guarantee a permanent exercise of our rights of access to culture in spite of failing institutional <clears throat> abilities during any given crisis, and substantially the sustainability of digital and financial resources, which means against data obsolescence, and in order to ensure the appropriate usage of the required investment. Of course, it has data interoperability, it has some possible problems, of course, and we are well aware of that. The first ones that come to mind are usually intellectual property. Even, but even leaving institutional issues aside and focusing simply on user experience, searching in a repository that contains dozens of millions of records, like Europeana or Wikimedia Commons, 
may seem daunting. On the other hand, we are, we are used to that, to that experience any single day with any ordinary internet search. Many will say that more information does not equal more knowledge. And may speak about info, infoxication. Well, let's see. Let's see what results we come to. Anyway, uh, I'm just uh, drawing to my close. Uh, all these challenges are the focus for, of our current work within SilkNow. I would like to finish this presentation adding that we are building a repository that learns from the experiences pre presented here and many others. It is also based on previous work carried out by other project partners and presented throughout the conference. This repository is named Ada Silk, as you can read, and it is named after Ada Lovelace, the British mathematician that anticipated some of the main features of modern computing some 100 years before its advent. She's, fam she's famous now by, that, by her phrase that uh, this future computation machine would weave algebraic patterns just as a Jacquard loom weaves flowers and leaves. Our repository gathers digital records about European silk fabrics produced between the 15th and the 19th centuries, kept in different collections, catalogued in different languages, and according to different standards. They are being harmonized through mappings to a single data model. Soon we will be doing testing of the repository so that testers are very welcome. And then next February, between the 15th and the 18th, we will also offer some free workshops uh, for museums and textile collections on their data management. These workshops will be titled From Museum Documentation to Digital Data Cur Curation, Challenges and Opportunities for Open Access. And all of you are kindly invited to participate. They will be done in four languages, English, Spanish, French, and Italian. So just please stay tuned to our newsletter and our social media for information, or simply just reach us by email if you of, of, or your institution might be interested. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Jorge, for this amazing presentation. I think it's quite tuned with the rest of our presentation that we have. And um, if you don't mind, I will leave the questions on the forum for later on. So because we are already behind the schedule and I would like to directly introduce the last speaker. So it's okay for you with you? Perfect. Okay, so let me, ladies and gentlemen, please let me introduce you to our last speaker. He is Dennis Bittich. He was a, he's a German <laughs> a scientist. And uh, well, he has a bachelor's in civil engineering from the Universidad de Hanover, from Leibniz University of Hanover. He has a master's degree in navigation and field robotics in the same university. And uh, currently, he is doing his uh, PhD studies at the Institute of Photography and New Information, also at LU. And the main topic is on deep learning and domain adaptation. And then, if he's going to introduce you, introduce us some thoughts on artificial intelligence meeting cultural heritage. So I think we started with a good fit. We we begin with we began with. Um, Sustainable development, and we passed through um, some catalog records in Sicily. Now we have that interoperability, and now artificial intelligence. So, Denis, whenever you want. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I hope everything is working properly. So, right now you should see my screen and see my eyes. Yes, <laughs> and maybe we can. You see me. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm very happy to be invited to present our work here um, for this conference. Before I start, I would still like to point out that this work was mainly done by Ms. Mareike Dorochinski, a good friend, a colleague of mine. Um, unfortunately, she didn't make it here today, so she cannot give the presentation, but um, I do my best to step in for her as good as I can. Um, all right, so the, or our topic, our main contribution to the SilkNow project is image-based classification um, for the prediction of properties of silk fabrics. And we prepared some slides uh, for the motivation, but actually the previous pro uh, presentation we just heard 
is a, a better motivation to what we are actually doing that um, I could motivate this topic. But I still want to repeat the um, essential, well, aspects uh, that lead to our work or are the prerequisites for our work. So by now you probably uh, heard that uh, the main goal or one of the main goals of the Stolknow project is um, to collect and also to provide knowledge about silk fabrics. And one way to do so is in the form of a digital online collection. So we heard about some examples in the previous presentation, so I don't have to go into detail here. Important for our work is that those collections usually uh, contain images of the silk fabrics. I mean, these are uh, visual artworks, so it's, it's reasonable to take images of them. Um, and additionally, we have some descriptive text um, which holds the properties of, of those fabrics. Um, it was called metadata in the previous presentation. And there we have several variables encoded, which could be of interest, like production place, where was it uh, created, when was it created, what is it made of, so this would be the material, and possibly even more of these uh, metadata or variables. And we heard that there already are um, several of, of such uh, collections are existing, like for example the Imatech, where this example was taken from. However, there is a problem with the existing collections, at least from an art historian point of view, possibly. What are these potential problems? Well, first of all, the properties, the information about the um, artworks is not standardized. Yeah? Um, and here's a quite nice example. For example, if we have a look at the production time and we see, okay, this piece was created um, in the 19th century, if we have a, if the information given as a plain text, this could be encoded in this way, 19th uh, century, but it could also be 19th century or, well, uh, 1801 to 1900, which also means 19th century. And although this is basically the same information here, it makes, for example, a computer-aided search very difficult or maybe sometimes even impossible. Um, because if we have the database and we want to retrieve, let's say, all the samples which are coming from that epoch, um, we maybe don't know what we are actually looking for in the descriptive text. Another issue is that the information may be incomplete, so there could be missing information about a specific uh, piece. So in this case, maybe the material is unknown. The information is simply not present in the database. And in our work, we are mainly focusing on this second issue, the incomplete uh, samples. So what is the solution we propose here? We as, well, let's call it uh, computer scientists, um, focus on image-based deep learning. And using such techniques, we want to create a classifier, an image-based classifier that, well, of course, has an input, the, an image of the fabric. Um, then in the middle, we have this classifier, and it should predict certain information about this, this piece, about whatever is shown in the image. So this could be the production place, the time or the material. Um, and the idea is that we use training samples. So um, it's called deep learning because we are kind of learning something about the data. Mm. We want to learn the machine, uh, we want to, to, for the machine to be able to recognize certain patterns which then again give information about the variables. This is called a training. And this, of course, requires training samples. So the idea is that for images where the variables are known, for example, we know where it comes from, the 
uh, parameters of the model are learned such that it can then be applied to new images where the uh, variables are unknown. So we want to predict it then for the samples where information is missing. That's the main idea. So the main approach is in this sense quite, quite simple. We want to learn from existing data, but of course, practically it's not that easy. So there are specifically some methodological um, problems we are facing here. And this is mostly related to the kind of database that we use for training the model. Particularly, we have very heterogeneous data base and also very few training data. This is particularly a problem for deep learning because you can think of the models having millions of parameters that have to be determined in the training process and the less training data we have available, the harder it gets to, uh, yeah, let's say, to, to create a proper model. If we want to predict multiple variables, then it could also be an issue when some of the information is missing. Of course, we are creating the model in the first place to predict the missing information, but during training, it would be easier if we had training samples where all the informations are given. Another issue we are facing is the imbalanced class distributions. We will have a look at this later in more detail. Um, and possibly different collections which we are using to create the database. So, um, let's have a little bit closer look how this training works. First of all, I want to show you the architecture that we are using. Um, so what's the model behind this classification? First, it was only a square. Now we have a little bit closer look. The architecture is um, or belongs to the group of so-called convolutional neural networks, CNNs. Those are basically models uh, from the deep learning domain, which specifically are good in dealing with images because they include um, yeah, um, operations that are particularly good for recognizing patterns in images. Um, and what you see here, which is um, named ResNet 152, is a so-called pre-trained backbone. So this is actually a quite large model, but in our case, we're using a pre-trained version. So this was trained initially on another data set, and here basically acts as a feature extractor. So you see, as input, we have the two-dimensional image, and it predicts a one-dimensional feature vector. So you can think of this as, um, yeah, just 200, uh, 40, uh, 2048 numbers which kind of describe the image in a reasonable way. So it already has some information about possible patterns and so on, but not yet about the classes. So this is why we attach another um, three layers, so two more hidden layers and a classification layer. And here you can think of, here we have all the uh, connections um, which all have a, a own weight, and these weights are learned during training. But, as you see, only the last two layers are learned here. We make use of this pre-trained backbone. If we, um, or, or the easiest way for image classification is if we just consider one web variable, for example, the material, we would have this kind of network. We uh, have as input one image and as output, well, the class for this particular variable. So which material does it belong to? Um, here, actually, we have k different class uh, scores, so we have to know in advance what kinds of materi materials actually exist in order to predict them. So one of our modifications here is when it comes to the multitask learning. So now we said, okay, we do not only want to predict one of the variables, such as the material, 
but also the production time, production place, and so on. So in this case, we were investigating the case where we have five different variables which should be predicted. So you can think of this as here we have um, maybe five different materials. So here we have five outputs. Um, the network predicts how much this image belongs to each of the corresponding materials. And in the end, the one with the highest score is uh, considered to be the right one, or at least the prediction of the model. Okay, so why are we not using a single network for all the variables? As you see here, we have a shared part. So especially the latent representation, the, the um, this first representation, the first one-dimensional representation of the image is transformed to a smaller feature vector. And this feature vector is used to predict all the different variables. So this is kind of a shared representation. The main idea here is that, well, information that, or let's call it patterns in the image that could be relevant for predicting the material could possibly also be relevant for predicting the production time, um, or there could be different relations. So we don't know this. Um, we are not uh, experts on the, on, on the um, images or the, the possible relations, but we know that in very similar applications, this actually um, can lead to a huge improvement because it requires less training data. So this was the main motivation why we were investigating this multitask learning approach. Let's have a little bit closer look um, on the training of these networks. I would assume that most of you are not that familiar, so you can learn something about this today. Um, first, we have a look at the single task learning. So we could formalize this task that we uh, want to have this network, and it should, of course, predict the correct class label for a specific uh, variable. And, as I already mentioned earlier, we learn the model making use of training examples. So, a training example always consists of an input image, like this one, and the reference class, so the real, the true class. Um, and during training, we initialize the network more or less randomly. Of course, we use the pre-trained backbone here, but that's just an implementation detail, so to say. Um, we initialize the network randomly and pass this image through the network, and it will make some prediction. Of course, the prediction will be random uh, in the beginning, but based on the prediction and the true class, we can formulate an objective function and consequently also an error that the network made. And this error can then be used to update the parameters of the model. This is done by something called gradient descent. And with each of these updates, so it's an iterative procedure, with each of these updates, the network will get better and better at predicting the correct labels for the training data. And hopefully it will learn something that, is, um, that can also be generalized to predict labels for new images. So how is this error formulated? Um, in the single uh, variable case, we use a regular cross entropy loss. Um, yeah, actually, I don't want to go too much into detail uh, to the math here. You can think of this as, well, for the correct class, we want to maximize the probability. In this case, we want to minimize the negative log likelihood. Um, but this is just some mathematical tricks here to make the computation of the gradients easier. So think of this as basically we want to um, adjust the parameters of the network such that the probability of the um, correct class is maximized. I think this should make sense. 
And we do this for all the training samples that we have. In the multi-class case, this is actually quite similar. Um, of course, we want the network to make the correct predictions for all of the variables. So we no longer have only one prediction, but we have several predictions for all the variables. At this point, we have to consider that maybe the training samples are incomplete. So um, maybe the technique is unknown. We don't have a reference label here. We don't know what this sample, um, what the correct label of this sample is um, for, for the technique. So we build the, the sum, the losses, built by taking the sum only of the variables that actually have a reference given. We, in this, this work for this uh, conference, we also investigated um, a variant of the loss, which should focus on hard examples. So you see, we have this additional weighting term here, which is kind of the inverse of the probability um, of the correct class. What it means is um, the more sure the network is about the correct prediction, the less is the contribution to the loss. So this is a mathematical formulation to let the network focus on hard examples, on difficult examples. And this has also been shown to um, increase the performance of these models. Okay, let's now come to the uh, experiments. First, let's have a look at the data set we are uh, we're using. From our colleagues, we got the data set with a little bit more than 20,000 images with annotations coming from six digital collections. For example, Ematech was included here. Um, and what is really mentionable here is that we actually had no images where all of the variables had a label. Yeah? So at least one of the variable was always missing. If we have a closer look here, we can see, okay, the, vari the variables are listed here. We wanted to predict. Um, they have a different amount of classes. So for example, there are three different materials that we would like to distinguish, 11 different places, and so on. And those here are sorted by the number of unknown labels. So for most of the examples, um, the material was given. We have a reference material. And for the category of variable subject depicted, um, actually only in 12.5% of the samples we had the reference label given. Here's another view on the class distribution. So by the variables we wanted to predict, you see, okay, um, on one side, the number of uh, samples with an unknown reference label is here depicted in blue. And you also see we have a problem of an imbalanced class distribution also for the known classes. So for material, one of the materials is very um, overrepresented, and two of them, well, we have much less samples here. And it behaves the, uh, very similar for all the other variables. Okay, so how did we do the experiments? What was our evaluation strategy? Here we used a technique called cross-validation. Um, the idea is that, well, let's assume this is all of our training samples, these five folds, so we split them randomly in five different groups. We use three of them for training the model. We use one for validation. This is basically to tune the model and the hyperparameters. And the last one is used for testing. Yeah, because we do not want the model only to be good for the training samples. Actually, we want to predict the labels for new images. So we have to evaluate how good is the model on unseen data. So this is a very important step. And then we um, change the order here yeah, to, to get a better um, or more representative uh, uh, score in the end, and the quality metrics are averaged. What are the quality metrics? Um, these are numbers that should indicate the performance of the model 
On the one side, we used the overall accuracy per variable. Um, this is basically the uh, fraction of correctly classified images, again, for each uh, variable. Here we have the problem that it's highly affected by dominant classes. So you can think of this if we have a two-class uh, problem, so it's either A or B, and in our data distribution, 90% of the data is class A and only 10% is B. Uh, if our model would always predict class A, it would have an accuracy of 90%. This sounds very good, but actually isn't very good because it, didn't, it maybe didn't learn anything about the, um, the patterns in the images. So what we also uh, were investigating or considering is the F1 score. Um, it's a harmonic mean of precision and recall. Important here is that it's more balanced and kind of equally considers the contribution of each class, also the underrepresented ones. Then we were comparing four different variants in order to um, see which version is working best. So our baseline here was single task learning where a model is trained for each variable. Then we had an extension with the focal loss. So this was the um, addition, the weighting term, which should focus on hard examples. Then we had the multitask learning version with the shared representation. And the combination is the multitask uh, focal uh, variant, where we have, well, we predict multiple variables, we deal with missing labels, and we use this additional weighting to focus on the hard examples. So let's have a look how these different models perform. First, we have a look at the F1 score. And we can see, well, first of all, um, the difference in the performance between the models is not that huge, but there are nevertheless some clear trends. So one thing that we can um, see is that basically in all cases or for all variables, the second version, the single task learning with the focal loss performs best. Um, we can also see that for the multitask learning, uh, excluding the technique, the focal loss of the red one is always better than the blue one, just with the exception here that I just mentioned. So we can um, tell that the focal loss is actually performing better than the regular cross entropy here. Nevertheless, we also have to um, recognize that the single task learning focal loss of the green one actually is better than the multitask version. So what I told earlier about our motivation for this approach, well, it for some reason it does not apply here. And I will come back to this in the, um, in the end. This is having a look at the overall accuracy. Um, here the single task learning performed best, but again, these numbers are not that representative for the performance of the model. So, um, yes, single task learning, as I just showed, did result in the best uh, performance. And especially important finding here is that um, the single task learning focal variant achieved the highest F1 score, which is, as we think, uh, most representative for the performance of the model. So what is our assumption why the multitask learning did not work as we expected here? Because we expected multitask learning to outperform the single task learning. Well, actually, we had many, many samples with missing labels. So um, we think that if we would have more samples without any missing labels, this would actually lead to a better performance. Of course, at this point, we cannot um, validate this assumption because we don't have a data set with many complete samples where all of the labels are given. But this is something we want to uh, validate in the future. So this brings me to the outlook. Um, so one, as I just mentioned, is data related. We Right now, we have a new data set and we are working on the new data set. 
um, with more complete labels um, and also a better representation so we no longer have the problem or let's say the problem of the imbalanced class distribution is uh, smaller which is also a benefit um, for the stability of the training. We also are having a look at, at some methodological extensions. Um, we want to consider new ways of dealing with the incomplete samples. Um, there are some other methods where, where we think those could help to achieve better results coming from the main adaptation, for example. And currently we also have work going on which uh, deals with uh, meta-learning, um, also quite promising results so far. Okay, so that's uh, my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. And I think we have some time for questions, right? Right, thank you very much. So I'm going to invite Jorge as well, if you don't mind, so we can be both here and answer because I think both couple of questions. So, well, first of all, I want to thank you, Dennis, for this amazing work that you're doing. I think the highlight is that actually you can predict information of fabric based on images, and that's great uh, for us as an, as an art historian. That's, that's really impressive because we never thought that we, we were able to do that, and especially to get all the information that a fabric can, can have. So, um, for you, uh, Dennis, Juan is asking that if it was complicated to work with an expert, try to classify images according to their knowledge versus what a machine can do. So, I think this is regarding the preliminary work. And may I ask you to stop sharing? Okay, so yeah. I can Mar go again. Yeah. If... Yeah. Ah, sorry, okay. So if it was complicated to work with textile experts and try to classify images according to their knowledge versus what a machine can do, I think it's complicated, right, to work with the main experts who we want to have the whole world in a bit and maybe not <laughs> feasible. So, how was that work? Uh, for me, you're asking? Yeah, yeah, for you, for you. Uh, well, it, it, it is a fact very interesting. Um, we are learning gradually. That's a good. Good, good thing for us with this, um, yeah, people coming from different domains, having different knowledge. We are, we can provide our methods and still learn something about the domain itself. So this makes it very interesting. Um, and well, in the beginning, sometimes we get some results that we maybe don't understand completely, but then in the discussion, it, it seems that uh, the results are maybe not that um, un unexpected as we thought in the first place. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I can imagine. It's, it's tricky. I would like to add, yeah, yeah, I would like to add in this regard that the surprises uh, come in both directions. Also for us uh, domain experts in the humanities, or in this case, in cultural heritage, it, it is very, very interesting to try to step down from our, let's say, own ideas and try to think of uh, alternative ways uh, to, to use this information. This might not be the place to get into, but we have had some really philosophical um, conversations about what similarity is because uh, an essential part of this work is trying to decide what, why two textiles are similar among them and how we can pin that down to mathematical parameters or parameters that can be uh, detected by the algorithms that the team in Hanover is using. 
So that that alone has been a very well, has been and is being a very interesting discussion in in trying to rethink the some issues that for us in the humanities might seem just assumptions. So yeah. of course that that it is being really really interesting. Yeah, and again for Denise, uh, we are asking, uh, what are the next steps, strategies in order to further improve your results? Yes, um, so we still have these two branches going on. So on the one side, we want to work further on the classification. Um, I showed you some of the uh, possible ideas we have here. So. The good thing is that image classification with deep neural networks is a super large field and it has so many related applications and we can learn from them and well one of our main jobs is to see what what would make sense um, of course then we are also developing those approaches further but right now as i said we are investigating the possibility of using domain adaptation meta learning um, those are basically approaches that uh, have, have shown to be successful in related domains. And now we want to see if it's also working in this um, area. Yeah. Quite interesting indeed. So Jorge, uh, someone is asking like, um, what is more appropriate in your opinions to include their collections, uh, European or Wikidata, or maybe both, <laughs> or depending, no, right? Yeah, thanks, Mar. Um, yeah, that was part of my my approach. Uh, there is no single answer to that question. It depends. It depends on the institution, depends on the collection, and depends on the expertise in, in managing digital data. But I would say that for, for European institutions, it makes a lot of sense to, to work with Europeana. Uh, it is stable, it has a strong institutional support, it improves over time, so uh, uh, it, it really makes sense. Of course, uh, uh, there are different steps uh, into that kind of collaboration. It doesn't have to be all out, and all I think it can be done by steps. But also, again, uh, maybe not these last years, but uh, three, two, three years ago, uh, we seemed to have a strong coincidence between Wikidata Commons and, and Europeana. There was a lot of collaboration going on so that data from one repository could be very easily exported into the other. So uh, again, it, it depends on the institution, it depends on the collection, and of course it depends on the needs. What kind of audiences are you targeting? I, I, I am really interested in, in Wikipedia. I see it as a growing global phenomenon that uh, institutions, cultural institutions, should pay more attention to. And so, uh, in, in a way, it provides many, many opportunities to reach audiences in a different way. So again, no single question, no single answer to the question, but as I said in my presentation, probably European institutions should take a look first at Europeana, something that none in Euro European institutions cannot do since it's limited to only member countries. Yeah, so thank you. And actually in this regard, I, I want to bring, and probably this is going to pop up this afternoon, but actually in Silk now we are also working with uh, these Wikidata things, trying to connect uh, Silk now or data with their well with their data. So actually we're already collaborating with them, and I want to encourage all the museums that are listening to us right now uh, to go, to be part of our workshop that was going to take place in February. And in this sense, uh, there's another question: like, how can I include my collection in Europeana? <laughs> oh well, that's a, that's a large question. Uh, I made <laughs> that's another presentation, right? <laughs> yeah, but going to the main issue, uh, uh, data providers are not expected to have a direct relationship with Europeana because they they will be overwhelmed. I mean, Europeana will be overwhelmed by the sheer numbers of of institutions, cultural institutions. So they work through aggregators. I show that very very briefly in my presentation. They have national aggregators and thematic aggregators. 
though, two different networks. So for instance, in fashion, we have European fashion, as will be explained on, on Friday. But, well, for many institutions, probably their first stop would be to find out about their national aggregator. In Spain, our national ministry of culture has Hispana. Hispana is, the, so to speak, the Spanish version of Europeana. So uh, you establish a relationship with them. There is some, of course, support and sometimes even training. And then you follow a step by step some legal agreements, etc. We haven't gotten here into the legal uh, requirements that are, I won't say they are strict, but they are some, for some institutions, they seem to be demanding. That means that institutions are required to share in Europeana only data for which, um, or mostly data, with, uh, which are in a simple way, to, to speak in a simple way, public domain or very similar to public domain. Uh, that, is, that shouldn't be a problem for most cultural institutions. It becomes a problem if you are dealing with uh, recent, I would say just mostly 20th century cultural productions, because in those cases, intellectual property rights are still, can still be enforced. But uh, we have many, many centuries before the 20th century. <laughs> so there is a lot to share. And, it's not as simple as this, and I know, but mostly I think this holds. So, uh, yes, that would be the, the, the thing, to, to contact the national or the thematic aggregator that is more appropriate to your collection. Well, in any case, uh, we can encourage all our <laughs> audience to come back in February, and maybe yeah. you can give us a... <laughs> Better lecture in the in this sense. So, Dennis, I want to have you to ask you a super quick question, and this is mine. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to look at uh, Maurizio Vitella's presentation and Georgia, but at some point they showed us like three different fabrics, which they were quite similar. Actually, they were green, <laughs> they were mask, and they have a pomegranate, but they they had some differences uh, in the motive in how they pomegranate was made, do you think that at some point, maybe in, not now, but maybe in the, in the future, in 10 years or in five years or, or the next year, are we going to be able to really distinguish between these small, small details? Yes, definitely. So right now, one problem is that we are, um, for example, downsampling the images. Yeah. So this has some computation um, reasons. It's simpler to deal with smaller images. So we are maybe missing some of the very small informations. Um, well, this also scales with the number of training data we have. So if we have more training data, we can learn even more details. Let me put it like this. But in general, I think of this as if a human can distinguish something, then it's possible for a machine as well. So this is the, this, I would say this is the lower bound. Um, theoretically, it's possible. Everything that we can detect is possible for a computer to, to detect as well, if we have the correct amount of training data and the right training data and the right training technique, of course. <laughs> Um, but I wouldn't limit it to that. So maybe a computer could even um, detect patterns and relations that we do, did not find. And this is, on the one side, this is uh, one of the things we are really looking forward to in the future uh, because we can do things with those kind of uh, learning algorithms that we didn't think are possible right now because we cannot do it as a human. On the other side, this makes it particularly difficult because the computer also sees things that we directly see as not relevant. I was talking um, before about the problem when images are coming from different domains. This could, for example, um, cause that the images have several properties which which come from the camera that were 
that was used to obtain the images. Yeah? Maybe they have a different illumination or something. And this is all information that the computer theoretically could use for the classification. Of course, it's not the right one. Yeah? The, the type of illumination should not affect the classification. And we as a human, um, of course, we are not considering such information. So this is the bad side about this, but the good side is that there's possibly also information that actually is relevant and which we do not see as a human, but could be learned by a computer. Wow, that sounds for me, it sounds like sci-fi, but <laughs> hopefully you <laughs> will get some results. So I want, I think we are going to close here now. I want to thank all our assistants today. It was a quite interesting session and I think that we managed to speak about more or less the same things without saying the same thing. So um, we, we really are going to the sustainable development way and to data interoperability and also to discover things here in fabrics and with ICT. So thank you very much for all our speakers here today. Um, thank you for our listeners. And I invite you everyone to come back at 3 p.m. sharp uh, we are going to have some more interesting discussions related. Actually, this time is going to go for ICT people. So I think you can find it quite interesting. And even if you come from the um, cultural heritage field, we're going to, to explore the signal knowledge graph. We are going to know about cross-lingual text classification and about CDOC CRM, which is actually really important for cultural heritage domain. So thank you very much. Um, thank you. See you at three. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.